Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kate Halliday, I'm Executive Director of SMMGP. I'm really pleased to be having a webinar today on children, families and substance use. SMMGP has a premium membership scheme which is a paid for scheme under normal conditions. We provide around 15 hours of CPD a year made up of webinars and pricey of research and comment. Uh, during this time of the pandemic, like so many organisations, we have opened the webinars up for everybody and you have responded in kind. Uh, there's lots of people registered for this webinar. We're really delighted with that. Um, and you have, as we are sent us in quite a lot of questions to help us structure how we're going to uh, carry on the webinar today. So thanks for that. We're hoping to get round and answer the questions that people have sent in. So the format of this webinar is going to be pretty much conversational in that I'm going to put the questions to our experts who I'll introduce in a second. Um, and we felt that this kind of shaped the, 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 the way life is at the moment during the pandemic. We've had to respond really quickly to a, a changing situation really fast. And we felt that actually hearing direct from the practitioners rather than perhaps having uh, PowerPoint presentations was the best way to do this webinar. So the webinar is being recorded and we will send on details of how to access it if you want to watch this again or if you want to invite your colleagues to watch it. You'll receive a, a follow on email tomorrow along with your certificate for attending today with a link of how to uh, watch the webinar again. And so I would like to now introduce our, our presenters today. We have uh, two people from ADFAM. Uh, we have Viv Evans, who is the CEO of ADFAM and also an OBE. And we have Kirsty Dolphin, who is Services Manager for ADFAM. Uh, so we have some real experts to talk to us today. Um, and Viv, I'd just like to start by asking you just to introduce ADFAM. I think most people do know about ADFAM, but just in case there are some people out there who, who don't. Oh, good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you for joining the webinar. Um, I think Kirsty and I, who actually are not the two ladies sitting on this photograph that you can see on the slide, um, but Kirsty and I were delighted that there's so much interest in work with families. And I think, given the COVID epidemic, that has been even more uh, sharply focused. So we're delighted also to be working with SNMGP on this. Um, uh, I'm just going to say a couple of words about ADFAM in case you don't know. It is the only national charity tackling the effects of alcohol, drug use and, and gambling now. We do have a project that works with um, and we're developing that's, that's working with um, families of problem gamblers. And we do, we do our, um, our mission is to improve the life of thousands of people. And when we um, conducted our YouGov poll last year, we found out that one in three people had at some time in their lives been affected by someone's substance misuse. So it's a real big problem and it's one that's, as you will know um, as well as we do, one that's often under the radar, hidden in plain sight and people don't want to talk, speak about it. Um, so we try to um, influence decision makers to understand the needs of these thousands of people who are coping with these problems, um, bring their needs and experiences and stories to their attention. So we hope that we can dispel all the stigma that surrounds substance misuse that attaches to families as well as to the users. Um, we provide training, guidance and a, a networking forums in seven areas for practitioners. Um, and over the next two, three weeks, we will be piloting um, Zoom forums. So you know, please, please look out for that. Uh, and we also work directly with families in seven areas. And um, we, um, we do this in a variety of ways. It's largely peer support. It might be consultancy and capacity building for um, other family, um, family support organisations. And we also provide a forum for families to get peer support from each other on our website. 
and our website's also got a lot of information. It's got a lot of information for families. Um, you'll see the um, the link down there, and it's also got a lot of guidance toolkits uh, for practitioners. So um, we'll probably say a bit more about that as um, as we go through the the webinar. But uh, yeah, that's Adfam. We're a small team, um, but um, very proud of um, all the the work that we're doing. Great, thanks, Liv. And I think what we will uh, do is provide that link as well to people uh, in the follow-on email as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to start putting some of the questions to you. I'd also just like to say to people who are watching, we're hoping there's going to be a bit of time at the end of today's webinar for some questions and answers. So if you have any or a comment, pop them into your chat box and I will hopefully be able to put them to our presenters uh, once we've finished our talk. Um, so I'll get on with the first question then. So somebody has asked, how is the pandemic affecting families of people who have alcohol and drug problems? Are things worse for them or are things better for some? Is it difficult for people to ask for and get help while everyone is at home together? I think Kirsty's going to lead on this one. Is that all right? Kirsty? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are our family are getting um, quite a broad range of feedback from families at this time. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, these circumstances with COVID-19 and lockdown, social distancing, etc., would be difficult um, in any circumstances let alone when substance misuse is present within families. Um, the question, how is it affecting drug and alcohol problems? Is it better or worse? Well, unfortunately, um, it's both. Um, we, it's worse for some families because the use, um, substance misuse is being highlighted because families are much more together with each other more of the time. Uh, and this causes tension. Uh, substance misuse is perhaps witnessed more. Um, it's communication becomes tough, tempers um, become ragged, there's blame and judgment around substance misuse. Um, and families are becoming more concerned that children are perhaps witnessing the substance misuse because it's happening within the house, whereas previously people would have been out at work, out at school, out in the communities, etc. Um, and it was easier to hide the misuse, and now it's very much coming into focus. To add a bit of balance to that, we are hearing from others where they're saying that the circumstances are better. Um, because temptation seems to be reduced. Um, people are not out and about socialising as before. Some families are managing successfully to focus on their home, their family, spending time together. So it's a bit of both, in all honesty. Um, many families that are struggling are having to focus on their sort of survival issues, if you like. So finances, work, school, the real nuts and bolts of life and, and get, getting support around those issues it has become a less of a priority. Um, so we are not yet seeing the steep incline of people coming into services, but we believe that that is something that is coming down the line and that is something that will happen in the fullness of time that people will start to re-engage on quite a sharp upward curve people are struggling sometimes to recognize that they need to get help um, and they're not prioritizing themselves in this topic and i think that's really common um, around substance misuse families tend to come for support around the substance misuser as opposed to around themselves. Um, and particularly in these times, lots of other things matter more. So children at home, homeschooling, work, health, finances, etc. So that's quite a convoluted answer, I appreciate, but um, people are finding it difficult to ask for help. Um, they're finding difficulty in finding space for themselves. Um, and they're finding it difficult to prioritise their need 
at this time? I hope that answers it. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Kirsty. And I've just noticed that uh, someone making a comment rather than a question, which is they're saying, yeah, the key um, protective factor for children has been schools and youth clubs. And obviously, with these closed, uh, some children are more more vulnerable. We would agree with that. Um, you know, a lot of protective factors rely on interactions with adults and services and institutions and, and mechanisms, support mechanisms out in the community. And obviously we're not accessing those at the moment. Sorry, Viv, I think you were wanting to say something. Yeah, no, I was just going to add that um, one um, potential vulnerability or increased vulnerability at this time um, is um, if um, there is methadone in the home and uh, we know that that can, can be a risk factor for children and uh, also we know about the extent of child to parent violence that can take place within, if I call it drug using households, forgive me if that's um, not, um, uh, I think um, we did some work some years ago and found out that a lot of adult children are very abusive towards their parents if they're using or the, the children, adult children are using and so I think that those two issues could well be exacerbated at this time during the lockdown. Well that, that um, leads really nicely into some of the other questions we've had so I'll move on to some of them. Um, Someone saying they're worried about the amount of prescribed medication that's going into households. I mean, I think most people will know there's been a big relaxation. Um, a lot of people who are maybe going to the pharmacy every day are suddenly getting maybe two weeks worth of medita uh, medication to, to take away. So they're asking, have you seen any problems? Um, is it this something you've heard about? Um, is it anything that people are reporting to you? Yeah, well, I would recommend a level of caution around this subject at the moment, but it's certainly something we need to be on the lookout for. Anecdotally, we are hearing so about some misuse of OSTs. Um, so when the lockdown originally happened, many services went from daily supervised consumption, um, packed in pharmacies or, or in services, to weekly prescriptions of OSTs. Um, and there's been some anecdotal reporting that scripts of methadone are being sold. Um, and um, because obviously people have more than they need in the immediate day. Um, and then the, and then that's causing, because obviously the, there's not enough available towards the end of the week for people to be using on top or to be illicitly um, purchasing OSTs. Um, uh, apparently street methadone is very cheap at the moment. Um, and to counter this, many services who are suspicious of misuse of prescriptions are reverting now back to supervised consumption. So. We've also heard that safe storage has been a concern for some families with more being prescribed than will fit in the safe storage boxes, um, but that's been fairly minimal. But at this stage, we haven't seen or heard reported of evidence of overdoses um, for excessive use of OSTs. Um, it's obviously vital that services speak to service users about safe storage, naloxone kits, safety measures around children. Um, and in fact, we, uh, ADFAM, have updated and reissued our leaflet on guidance for families on OST, and that's um, available on our website. So at the moment, it's a small amount of anecdotal. We haven't seen any hard evidence, but it's something we need to say, uh, stay super vigilant about. Yeah. Thank you. And actually, we're getting a few comments coming in um, about this. Uh, someone is saying, so far, they've had no drug overdose deaths. So, uh, uh, it's something that I've been hearing is that, you know, there aren't that many critical incidents or uh, drug uh, overdoses that people are aware of. However, I think we need to be cautious because it might be that the normal reporting systems have been really disrupted during the pandemic. Uh, but they're saying they haven't experienced um, overdose deaths. Um, 
all the clients have been um, given naloxone, which was the point you were just making. In their area, chemists are refusing to do supervised consumption. So um, I think there's obviously mixed approaches across the country to this. Yeah, sure um, there is. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question, um, which is something that you did touch on earlier. Uh, someone's saying it's concerning to hear about increasing levels of domestic violence in households. Have there been any problems, um, as far as you're aware, um, have you noticed an increase? Is it something you've picked up on or would you pick up on it? Well, uh, we do get feedback on domestic violence and um, I mean, it's a very common scenario at the moment that everybody is stuck in the same household and, and they're unable to find space from each other. Substance use can be seen and there's more awareness around substance misuse. Um, communication can be tricky with, with, and sort of fall into a negative pattern of nagging, judging, blaming, etc. And this can escalate into verbal abuse and that's what we're hearing is that um, we're hearing a bit about low level DV moving up to a medium level. There's no escaping each other, so boundaries are blurring um, and people are losing their common coping strategies and feeling like progress is lost. So it's a, it's a difficult situation. We're, we're monitoring it all the time and the families we're working with are you know, when we work with families around DV, we're often talking about um, their safety um, networks and, and what they would do in, if when they find themselves um, in dangerous circumstances. And families are often a bit are confused at the moment about what they can do, because most of it in the past was about potentially going out, making some space speaking meetings, speaking to friends, getting support from other organisations, GPs, treatment services, uh, social services, etc, etc. And people are, are a bit confused at the moment as to how they should engage with that support. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, Kirsty, and um, we did run a survey of family members um, to ask about their experiences at the moment. And um, our colleagues are just pulling together all the evidence from that, as we had a very, very um, big response. And certainly um, the issue of domestic violence was perceived to be one that family members were more wary about, worried about. Um, but that also, and that also applies to their own mental health as well. Um, I think, you know, we um, domestic violence is associated can be associated with substance issues, which can be exacerbated at this time, um, and so can stress and anxiety and mental ill health for the family member. That's another concern. Okay, thank you. Was there an element of that question around assessment as well? Um, what is it? Uh, there wasn't. I think it would be great if you could if you could talk a little bit about that because um, a lot of people watching are probably people working within drug and alcohol treatment services. Um, I'm guessing many of you out there will be doing quite a lot of online work. Um, so yes, uh, I think it would be interesting if you could talk a little bit about how people watching this webinar might be able to assess. I think um, in terms of um, assessing the need um, around domestic violence. I think it's just important that as professionals um, we really need to make sure that we're asking the important questions and I think it's asking difficult questions is about finding the words that are right for you. We all have our own ways of doing it. Um, it's not as simple as saying, right, here's five questions, ask them, and, and that would be good enough. I think you have to find the words that, that suit you and, and your way of working. But in essence, we need to be asking the important questions. Are you concerned for your safety and well-being? And if the answer is yes, tell me about this. So you need to open it up and, and try and ascertain the information. Are you concerned for your child's safety and well-being? And then what are the concerns? And what safety plans do you have in place? 
Now, we need to, as practitioners, to be mindful of our own local authority safeguarding thresholds, the pathways and contact numbers, uh, and make sure that we're applying what we're hearing to those safeguarding thresholds. Um, as a group of practitioners, we create a safety net around um, families. Um, and it's important that we stay connected with each other as professionals, that if we hear that a family's engaged with another organization, that we do try and touch base to ensure that what we're hearing is an accurate reflection of the circumstances, to ensure that holes don't appear within that safety net. Um, I would also say that it's really important that we trust our professional curiosity. Um, there's a difference between professional curiosity and just being nosy. Um, but we know as professionals how to um, dig a little deeper, ask a more revealing question. And we need to avoid the pitfalls of professional curiosity. Um, you know, when we know a family well, we might normalise some of what we're hearing, um, we might not see an accumulating risk pattern. We need to make sure that we're seeing the whole picture, make sure that we're not being overly optimistic and rationalizing new and escalating risk. Whilst we need to connect with our partners, we can't defer um, risk to another organization to pick up. If we hear something's going on, we need to do something about it. Um, and also just make sure that we're not just looking for evidence to support our point of view, that we're staying very open-minded to the information that's coming in, listening really hard to actually what's being said. And if we're not sure, questioning it. Um, Assessing around domestic violence, around substance misuse, around family support is always tricky, yet alone, when we're doing it remotely or we're doing it uh, amongst the challenges of COVID-19. Well, that... Actually, we're getting, yeah, yeah, I think we're getting a flurry of questions now. People are getting interested in this. So I might just ask you, because they're about domestic violence, um, somebody is asking um, about managing to assess this while perhaps other people are in the car uh, in the house and whether you can encourage people to go into their cars or go somewhere where perhaps they're not overheard is that is that an issue yeah it definitely is an issue um it's it's about you know whether it's um assessing or delivering groups or one-to-one -one interventions finding the right private space is a real challenge at the moment um, and I think it's about checking out with your client and sort of saying I've got some quite personal questions I need to ask you is now a good time or should we catch up at another time or if they there isn't another time it is do you have a room that you could go to where you can speak privately sitting in your car yeah that works um, maybe sitting outside you know if you've got some outside space it i mean obviously it's how long is a piece of string in terms of what are the potentials and opportunities but we do if if you're going to have those conversations they need to be had out of the issue of children and definitely avoiding um risks in terms of perpetrators potentially listening in and that applies, those sort of rules apply to setting up Zoom groups as well for peer support. Mm. Um, um, you know, we've developed a set of protocols so people who are joining our peer support groups or facilitated structured groups will feel safe because of the reasons that we've just outlined. So I think it's it's the one-to-one -one work, it's the group work as well. We need to be really aware of there's no safety issues for family members. And uh, one more question on domestic violence before we move on. Um, someone's asking, do you feel that the cases of domestic violence that you are hearing about are, are pre-existing cases that have maybe been made worse because of the pandemic? Or are you picking up that there are new cases that have come about because of the pandemic? Unfortunately, it, it's really both. Um, I think um, the fact the fact that we're all living so closely at the moment is stretching our coping strategies. 
Um, and we all know as human beings that we're worse to our family than we would be to strangers in the street. We're less forgiving to our family than we would be to somebody that we met in the shop. So communication, we get irritable, we're frustrated, we can't get out, we're taking out the circumstances we find ourselves in on each other. Um, and that's without adding substances to the mix. So I think, you know, it, it's, we're seeing new cases emerge into the lower levels and we're seeing the lower levels that are already existing hiking up the risk, risk ratings really. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is, somebody is saying providing services online has been interesting. Yep. I found there are some advantages, uh, there are less DNAs and some people really like talking on the phone but there are some disadvantages. Uh, for example, it can be difficult if people are around, which is something you've just uh, mm -hmm. discussed. Um, and I can miss things. And the question is, is, is this something you're finding? Yes. <laughs> it's a very short answer. Yes, yes, that is definitely something we're finding. We can, I can agree with you that we have better attendance rates. We feel that, um, you know, one lasting um, legacy of this pandemic will be that the accelerated virtual practice um, will probably remain into the future. Why should people travel into central services for a consultation um, if services can be delivered effectively remotely? Um, however, there will always be a need, obviously, for some appointments to be held face to face, particularly medical and prescribing appointments. Um, we um, we have gathered sort of some feedback um, around um, operating remotely. Um, we do feel that we need to review our contracts with our families in advance, um, in advance of the appointment, in a manner that allows for there to be questions and understanding for why we're um, perhaps doing things differently. So I, we feel um, our practice is improved when we've checked the expectations of the session with the family member in advance. Is it a structured session, therapeutic, peer? You know, why are we why are we getting together? And that leads us then to understanding the need for privacy, confidentiality around the session, and making sure that that can be delivered. Um, we obviously need to agree boundaries. I've, I've personally found that some uh, remote sessions can go on for ages and it feels more like friends talking and you have to catch yourself and remember that actually this session has a deliberate purpose. Um, and we just need to make sure that we can keep the session safe. Um, you know, if it's a group, what are the group rules? Um, and we need to clarify consent and GDPR, can you record the session, how what notes are going to be kept about the session. So in order to deliver remotely, we need to almost go back to our contracting and understand the agreement that we have with our families. Um, yeah, that's definitely some learning that we've made from it. Yeah, um, I mean, just to add to what Kirsty said, um, that's why we did we developed some very some, some protocols around this, but the feedback that we've had so far from our Zoom groups um, is extremely positive. And um, in fact, one of the only glitches was the technology, but that did prompt me to think, or oh, just to say, um, that not all our families have got access to the internet and access to Zoom and digital technology. Um, certainly some of the um, older carers that we work with in one of our projects it's works with kin carers so I think we just we need to remember that we're adapting to technology but it might not always be the answer because there might be very well be some families where um, they just perhaps don't have Wi-Fi and internet whatever for whatever reason and we're trying to overcome that with uh, trying to fund to get um, some technology in place for some of those families Thank you. And uh, yeah, we're having people saying they're finding similar that the support groups in their area 
have really thrived. The online support groups are actually doing really well. Um, similarly, there are people talking about GDPR. They've managed to cover that by emailing consent and yeah. getting consent forms sent back. I'm not sure whether your protocols are available to share, but someone here would love to see them. I'm, I'm not sure if you're at that stage with your your your, your group protocols. I mean, we weren't quite, were we, Kirsty? I mean, we discussed this and thought, oh, we might have to issue some sort of health warning in inverted commas, um, because if some of these actually, some of our protocols don't work for everybody, um, we wouldn't, you know, we we would have to say, look, you know, this isn't our responsibility. This is just based on our findings. Uh, so we may well do that in future. We'll, we need to talk a bit more about it, I think, to make yeah. sure that a bit more feedback. But I think at the moment, you know, if we say that they're suggestions that we found helpful and if people understand that, uh, it, you know, they may not work for everyone, then that's the health warning that would go with them. Okay, and I think uh, we're hopefully going to have time. We're just going to take a quick whiz round your website at some point uh, during this webinar, and uh, people can maybe just be aware to to check on the AdFam website because I'm guessing that's where you'd start sharing that sort of information. Um, yeah, and certainly it's the sort of thing where we could we could share with our members once you were once you were ready. Thank um, you. Okay. Um, and another question here is, um, I think you've, in a way you've, you've answered some of this, which is how can I do better assessing uh, the effects of drug and alcohol use on children? We've, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, but this question is also asking, is it best to involve the person with problematic drug and or alcohol use? when working with families or not? Okay, well, mm, that's, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think it's worth stating from the outset that AdFam advocate for the family. Um, and what we hear a lot of from our families is that there's little support out there for them as individuals. Uh, people with substance issues can often access a wide variety of support um, from treatment services, from the mutual aid groups, counselling, etc. And families have much less available to them. Um, and additionally, a fair amount of what does exist for the families um, doesn't really recognise them necessarily as unique individuals in their own right with their own sets of needs and challenges. A lot of services kind of see the families as recovery collateral for the treatment service. And that can be true, but it shouldn't be the limitation of family support. So what we do say is that we need to make sure that we're understanding the family's need, um, understanding where they are in their journey, um, making sure that we're asking some of the basic questions. So how can we do better assessing the family? Well, it's really listening to what's happening for them, being aware of risk and safeguarding, listening for the clues, asking what the family member wants, looking at family values, strengths and needs. So coming to it from a strengths angle, identifying what's good, what needs work, and then looking at that gap. Um, using an appropriate support model, so you could be looking at craft, you could be looking at the five-step model, you could be looking at brief in interventions like motivational interviewing, frames, grow, etc. And then obviously during that assessment, once you've identified those things, review, check your understanding and agree your way forward. Um, remember that families are not in treatment, um, that rarely is this mandated support. It's, it's a voluntary engagement most of the time, um, and it's an opportunity to work with a family before hopefully they become at risk or chaotic or problematic. Um, and we must always remember that not all the families that we engage with are problem families. Um, so I think um, in terms of, of assessing the effects of drugs and alcohol, it is asking and listening and then devising a way forward. I think it's fair to say that not the, the interventions 
um, like Craft and Five Step that Kirsty mentioned, um, they're not universally available. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, looking to support the family, which is what we do, um, we there's quite a lot of interventions, some interventions can very, very much focus on the user's recovery um, and also sometimes see the family as dysfunctional. And I think what we would say is that uh, we want the family to be an enabling um, function, have an enabling function, but also, um, to repeat, Kirsty, again, um, for that family those family members to be seen in their own right to have support needs and um, I think often because of the financial um, the financial situation family members often only get some support when their loved one is is in treatment and we know from our work that uh, this uh, many many thousands of family members perhaps their loved one has never been in treatment or has been out of treatment for years and yet they are still um, they still feel that they're um, suffering the effects of those experiences on them. I wondered if you wanted to say something about, you were talking, Kate, about one of the questions was about, I think, about effects on children. And I just wondered if Kirsty wanted to say something about adverse childhood experiences in this part of the webinar. As a, um, you know, and I think that was the question, Kate, wasn't it? There was part of the question was about effects on children. Am I right? Yeah, it's about how to, to, to assess, how they can best assess for that. Um, okay, well, I think um, if you're assessing a family um, affected by substances, then obviously be aware that substance misuse is one of the ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. There are a number of ACEs, as I'm sure you all know, domestic violence, uh, parental abandonment through separation, divorce, mental health, victim of abuse, victim of neglect, household member being in prison, and so on. Um, and obviously, anyone with four or more ACEs in that within their childhood has um, a worse um, health, mental well-being outcomes. Um, and educational outcomes than somebody with fewer ACEs. So I think, you know, again, it's looking at that whole picture when we're doing the assessments and when we're looking at children, looking at the whole picture, looking at the ACEs, looking at trauma, risk, etc., and joining the dots to find the most appropriate progress way forward. Thank you. And, and I wondered whether I could just ask the audience a question now. OK, I'm going to just ask the audience about how things are in their area. And so what I am asking is, do you feel your area provides good support for children and families of people who use alcohol and or other drugs? And people are still voting, so I'll wait for a little while until we've got this is like who wants to be in it is it is <laughs> okay uh so i am now going i'm going to end the voting on this and i'm just going to share the results there uh so as you can see actually that's quite encouraging 50% of you feel that there are good services um, 29 percent feel not and 12 percent um, aren't sure uh, so I will encourage you that, yes that I is encouraging that. yeah um, okay I'll move on to the next question which you were beginning to discuss actually around criminal justice issues um, we've had a question from someone who works in a prison um, and they are working with men who have or have had a history of drug and alcohol use. Um, and they're asking specifically, and I think you've begun to answer some of this question actually, uh, Kirsty, but um, how do you think that substance um, abuse affects those children whose parents are in custody? <laughs> Oh, OK. Um, right. Well, um, early childhood exposure to substance use by any parental figure can normalise the behaviour um, and increase the potential of creating a cycle of use 
in the future. Um, children do struggle with abandonment issues when a parent goes to prison or when a parent leaves a household, whether it's for a medium or long period of time, it creates the anxiety, uncertainty, stress. Um, and obviously, both examples, as a parent in prison and substance misuse, are two of the ACEs we've just described. Um, but in terms of the questions sort of asking uh, whether it's um, different for men, I don't think there's a difference between men and women in terms of which parent um, has a substance issue or which parent is incarcerated. Um, I think the effect on the children would be the same. Um, and, and yeah, it has a potential to be damaging to young people unless the effects are mitigated by a plan or a parent um, that understands what's happening for the child. Yeah, and I think often, um, often men do get uh, fathers, I think, the needs of fathers who are in, uh, in prison sometimes, well, any father is a drug user, I think, um, tend to get um, a bit marginalised and forgotten sometimes. The focus is very much on the mother, I think, in, um, in, in the parenting role, and the role of fathers is sometimes um, forgotten. Thanks, Fid. Well, that kind of leads on to the next part of this question from the same person. Um, and they're asking, do you think there's stigma with men seeking support in custody for drug use uh, with their families? Uh, in, in other words, it sounds like what they're saying is they don't want men, that men don't want their families to know they are prescribed methadone, for example. Um, or, or they just don't disclose that they have been using drugs in prison? Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I would, again, I would say that our experiences is that men and women both typically hide their level of substance misuse um, because of perhaps shame and embarrassment, stigma, fear of social, uh, social care involvement maybe, loss of status. Um, recognising that this has got to a level that their family are going to be impacted by their behaviour and their substance use. Um, and I think that's true for many substance misusers, whether they're in the criminal justice system or not, um, that there is stigma around your use, admitting the level of your use, um, revealing it to your family. Um, is a, a tremendous concern to a lot of family pe family substance misusers. Um, and with regard to sort of then further use or starting use within the criminal justice system or adapting their use in prison, so maybe they have they're taking more or their their treatment has changed, then again I think that people worry that if that happens within the prison environment, if they told their family outside that potentially their family wouldn't welcome them back into the household or they would even be prevented from returning to, to their home by social care potentially or those sorts of organisations. So there is a real issue around um, trust that substance misusers feel that they can tell the truth about what's going on for them um, and how that will consequently impact their family. And I just to add, I think the stigma attaches itself to families too, and families don't want to own up to own up to talk about what's going on for them on so many occasions, whether they've got a loved one in prison or not. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Viv. Um, and, and one more question um, from the people who sent things in, but we have a, an awful lot of questions coming in from the people who are watching, so I'm keen to try and get round to them too. Um, and again, this is from the prison worker. Could we deliver a group or course on or around the effects of substances on children who have the parent in custody? So I think they're talking about running a course with the parent here rather than for the children, would that be something they could do? I think it's a really interesting idea. 
Um, and off the top of my head, um, I think it could perhaps focus on support of breaking the cycle of use in the young person's serv um, drug service might be able to support around that um, to make sure that substance misuse and those behaviours and habits are not being passed on generationally. I think work around mitigation of ACEs, what support yeah. and care is needed for children and families around incarceration substances. Um, and also, I think something that is not always worked on, but is really important, is perhaps working with families on preparing um, for right. a parent going into custody and returning from custody. So often the, the person going away will do some work, counselling, treatment whilst away, um, but the family kind of get left on their own in that period and then this person returns home and the family are still where they were when he, when that person went away and little is done with that family to get them ready for what comes afterwards and for a transition to have happened so i think of course would be really interesting and i think you know there are a number of things that it could focus on i think it would be a great piece of work yeah i agree and just build on that for a second we did have some money from a trust some years ago to work with um, the fa families and the young men in um, in a young offender institution and that was just three sessions that was facilitated by a f trained facilitator. Um, the first session worked with the young men to look at what they believed the effects of their li lifestyle and their drug taking had had on their families. Then there was a session with the family members um, to give them insight into the cycle of change and setting boundaries, for example. And the third session, third and final session, was when the young men and their families got together, and some of them were fathers as well, got together and looked at how they could better communicate and how they could, what they were going to, what was going to change when they, when they were released. So, and that was very well received, but I'm afraid we only had the money for one lot of sessions but it, it was a nice model I think that others might want to think about and in fact we've got somebody here who says they run such a group and oh. the feedback is that there are long-term benefits to this long-term beh behavior changes and we've had somebody saying they run a group that moves from prison into the community which is interesting and so there's that um, through care um, yeah. Now, um, we've had both sent in before this webinar and at, at least two or three questions as the webinar has been going on. People have been asking whether um, there are online resources. And so, mm -hmm. Kirsty, I was going to ask you if, we, if you would take us through some of what's on AdFam's website, um, because I know you, that you have some resources there. And so hopefully yeah. people can now yeah, see your screen, yes. So um, so this is the just the home page for um, the AdFam website. I'm just going to have to move this box a second because it's in the way. Um, uh -huh. And it, within the AdFam website, let me just go back to the home page, there are a number of resources available to you. Um, so if you look, I mean, there's help for families and there's a number of tabs you can see there that would help people out. Under our work, there is support for families. And if you click on the tab here, then there are a number of resources available to you. Under resources, a range of publications. And here, there are numerous guide, guides and leaflets that families might find useful. So, I mean, just looking at the top two, living with a drug user, this is for parents of drug, using, drug users. The second one is for partners of substance misusers. Bouncing back, a creative learning pack for drug and alcohol prevention work with families. So there's loads and loads of resources in here that are just free for you to use to inform your practice or with families that you're working with currently. There's a lot of other um, 
support if you're looking for local support, helplines, forums, etc. Listening to others' stories can be really useful. But without wanting to bore you witless, if you look under our COVID-19 tab, there are um, different things in here, top tips for um, around COVID-19, lockdown uh, stories, useful resources, family activity packs. Now, the family activity packs we're creating in place of the family activities that we deliver under a number of our contracts. And again, it's there for you to download, have a look at, give to families. So there's a lot there that's free. Um, and I was just thinking, uh, the questions that we had at the end there about prison um, and what's happening for families around prison, there's a great organization called PACT, and this is their website. I was looking at it earlier. Um, and they've got training and events around families, children, and young people. So I would have a look at that. But the AdFam website has loads and loads of resources available for you. All free. <laughs> Indeed. All free. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and also, um, just because somebody is uh, interested in hearing about other resources, um, Breaking Free Online has resources for people who are using drugs. Yeah. And uh, you can, uh, in fact, I'll pop that in the follow on email. It, they, it's normally a paid for service, but it is free. And so that's something for perhaps the person within a family who's having problems with uh, drug or alcohol use as well. Okay, we've got loads of questions. I don't know if we're going to get around to all of them. I'll, I'll do my best. Someone is asking, have you had many reports of families struggling with their teenage children um, in terms of the children not complying with lockdown, going out and drug seeking? Oh, I think we'd um, have to look at our survey for that. I don't know if Kirsty's got any anecdotal evidence. I have heard a little. I haven't heard a lot, in all honesty. Um, I have heard a little. Um, an organisation that I really like around um, teenagers is Family Lives. If you look for familylives.org.uk, that's another organisation. They have some great resources around dealing with teenagers. Um, <laughs> Dealing with anger, dealing with um, substance misuse, all of those sorts of things. So um, Family Lives is a good organisation. I'd recommend you go and have a look at what they've got on their website around teenagers. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody's talking about online working and saying... Some of the online working has been having a detrimental effect on the on, on the workers in her team um, with the fears about uncertainty, risks within family homes, no face-to-face -face contact. Any tips on practitioners looking after their own well-being? Um, I would say that maybe we, we need to reinforce our own um, boundaries at this time. I think it's really important that we structure our appointments with our families um, as we would if we were delivering them face to face. So um, fixing a time, you know, the start and how long a, a meeting will last. And just remembering that because we're coming to each other from home to home. You know, you're in my home now, all 200 of you, um, that, that, that there is still a professional boundary there and that we remember that the advice we're giving or the support that we're giving stays within our professional remit. Um, but one thing we've adopted is we now have weekly team um, meetings where we get to share our stresses and our concerns and families that are worrying us. Um, you know, we used to have monthly supervision and clinical supervision and all of those things, but we've gone to weekly, um, which felt arduous to start with, but it's been essential for the team to feel connected 
um, and for them to deal with matters arising rather than holding on to them. Um, so that's just a couple of things that we've done. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I'm sitting here in my house, which has got plenty of space. And I know from a couple of colleagues of mine um, who are of ours, who are um, living in, um, you know, they're young people in shared uh, with housemates. And it's not always easy to find a, a space just to sit and do your work quietly. And um, there's a lot of demand on the Internet. Uh, so I think uh, on our we need to look after ourselves in all this situation. Um, our website's got some top tips for well-being, mental and physical well-being. That I mean, I think every website has. Uh, but I do think it's important to try, as Kirsty said, try and keep together as a team. And I think for us at AdFam, this has been um, one of the bonuses, if or one of the positive things that's come out of this crisis, is that we do have, I think, more support for each other, um, as well as you know, and often our uh, a lot of support for each other and we have a we have a weekly quiz as well so we've been having more fun than we normally have <laughs> normally get time <laughs> so that, really, that's something that I really appreciate it and I brought, I'm glad you brought that up because I know a lot of people are finding especially if they're working from home that they are in tunnel vision work and the yeah. work is very intense and whereas things may have been broken up a little bit at work with a tea break people are working very long and hard and I think it's nice to remind ourselves that it is okay to take breaks and if possible have a bit of fun. Indeed, yeah. Um, there is another question, interesting question here. Um, the ACEs measure has now been extended to measure beyond just the family level issues. It's now also a measure that includes adverse community experiences. Mm. Um, do you think that's import an important change? It, I mean, obviously, um, adverse community um, activity. So it can be very dependent on on geography and geographical circumstances. Um, but we do know that you know the challenges faced by families living. Um, in inner cities um, is different from those living potentially in rural communities. Now that doesn't say one is better or worse than another, it just says that they're different. Um, and normalisation of certain set of circumstances, whether it's rural or city centre, um, those things need to be taken into account. I think, you know, the broader the picture, the better we can be at ensuring that this safety net around children and around families is robust and extensive enough. So I think, you know, I don't think that means that every community has ACEs or that every family experiences ACEs within their community, but if they exist, they need to be factored in. Yeah, and I think it's... Um... I would say it's a positive thing to include communities um, because it does take away, well, it includes other factors as well as, I won't say blaming the family, um, but um, it puts the family in a context, I think. And, uh, you know, no family is, family has to be seen, I think, within the broader context of our society and the communities in which we live. So I would see that as a strength. Okay, and I think this will have to be the final question. I'm sorry if I didn't get round. As Viv says, we've had over 200 people join us uh, today. So we're really delighted and, and you've sent such great questions. Um, there is a, a question here about, are you planning for a, a, a transition phase now? Obviously, we've been in lockdown for a while. Uh, are you making plans for a transition phase at the moment? Um, and could you see yourselves going out and seeing people a little bit more often or are you are you waiting to hear more? I think we're waiting at the moment we're business as usual if you like we're waiting to hear more um, I think for us um, obviously you know it'd be great when we can have events and face-to-face -face meetings and, and offer face-to-face -face support for families again but I do think and I think this point about to be made so forgive me within this era uh, this current you know our, our um, you know the 21st century 
uh, what we were doing at AdFam anyway was looking at ways that we could support families um, and practice families and practitioners uh, using digital technology. So we were we were beginning to think about it anyway, and this has really ramped up the pressure on us to develop it and deliver it. And I can't see that going away entirely. And I think that will be a positive. Um, I think the days of people giving up time to go out in the evening and be in a group, they they may be okay for some people, but not for everybody. And so I think that um, the opportunities that uh, we have with digital connection um, will continue. But that doesn't mean to say that human contact isn't absolutely vitally important and will um, I hope through the transition and into the next whatever happens, we'll be able to offer both digital and face to face when that time comes. But for the moment, we're doing as we're told. <laughs> we we are campaigning a little bit as well around recognition that transition back to normal, whatever normal ultimately is, is going to be really difficult for children, particularly and young people. Um, we, we think that going from old world to lockdown was difficult. I think going back from lockdown to freedom was very difficult, difficult. too. Um, and children will really struggle with the boundaries and, and the um, restrictions that come back into their lives, having not lived with them for quite a long time. You, for example, going back to school, sitting quietly, um, not talking, not fidgeting, not getting up, going to the loo, eating and drinking whenever they wanted to. So we are, in some bids that we're writing, we're raising this at the moment around the fact that there needs to be another transition out of this um, to wherever the new normal will be. Yeah. Our time is up. Um, Kirsty, thank you so much. You have been fantastic and you've given us a really strong feeling, um, not simply of working in the pandemic, but also some of the issues that are enduring to do with uh, working with children and families. So thank you so much. And um, Thank you so much as well to the audience. You'll get a follow on email tomorrow with your certificate and the links we've discussed. Um, uh, you'll get a, a link to the recording of this webinar if you want to share it with your colleagues or watch it again yourself. Um, so thank you, everyone, and I hope the rest of your day goes really well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, and thank you, everybody, for your questions.